Bonjour. So I'm François Xavier Bay from the Pasteur Institute. I'm in charge of a lab uh, which is responsible for the national laboratory surveillance of several uh, bacterial infections like Salmonella, Chigella, Vibrio, E. coli infection in France. So uh, it's a really a pleasure for me to be here and I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present you this a uh, recent research work aiming at <coughs> un a better understanding of the uh, circulation of cholera in Africa over the last decades. So what is cholera? There are several definitions of cholera and uh, you need first a pathogen. The pathogen is a bacterium, Vibrier cholerae, belonging to zero group O1 and containing the CTX toxin. We will see later that not all uh, cholera O1 CTX positive are associated with epidemic cholera. The CTX toxin is responsible for the digestive symptoms, in particular the liquid diarrhea, and uh, this is a severe diarrhea leading to uh, a massive dehydration. The context is also important. Uh, cholera is associated with explosive outbreaks and you have often a context of war, civil conflicts, you have uh, also human gathering after climatic events leading to uh, uh, bad access to clean water, good hygiene and decent sanitation. And finally the bacterium is transmitted from human to humans in a direct way or also in an indirect way through food contaminated or water contaminated by feces or vomits. So there are one million people, uh, one billion people at risk uh, on Earth and uh, mostly in Asia and Africa and recently in uh, uh, Latin America with the Haitian outbreak. And there is an estimation of uh, between one and four million new cases every year uh, resulting in uh, around 100,000 deaths. And finally, the treatment is uh, rehydration and also antibiotics have been used as a complementary treatment to shorten the duration of the diarrhea and thus preventing the dissemination of the bacterium. So, uh, some words of history. Uh, the story starts a long time ago around the Bay of Bengal in uh, India and uh, officially in 1817 started the first uh, pandemic of cholera. It means that the bacterium spread beyond India and so and uh, reached uh, Asia, China, Middle East and at that time East Africa. It was Zanzibar at that time. So it was in, during the early 19th century. And then during the 19th century, six other uh, pandemics have been uh, described. And during the, five, the fifth pandemic, uh, Robert Koch isolated the uh, bacterium, Vibrio cholerae. But during the second pandemic, an Italian uh, scientist uh, observed for the first time the bacterium. So we are sure of the uh, pathogen uh, during the fifth and the sixth pandemic because at that time we entered into the microbiology era and people believe that all the first pandemics were also caused by the same uh, bacterium, Vibrio cholerae, biotype classical. And recently thanks to the jar, you can see here, containing uh, uh, intestine from uh, a victim of the 1849 outbreak of cholera in Philadelphia, so during the second pandemic, by sequencing, 
people where scientists obtain a sequence of Vibrio cholerae biotypal classical. So now we can confirm that three of the six first pandemics of cholera uh, have been caused, were caused by uh, Vibrio cholerae classical. So the last pandemic stopped uh, during the 1920s. And unexpectedly, during the 60s, start the seventh pandemic. So unexpectedly, because it starts uh, not in the Bay of Bengal, but in Indonesia, in the Sulawesi island. And the first case were caused by a novel pathogen. It was not the uh, classical uh, Vibrio cholerae, it was what they call at that time the biotype Eltor. It was even a species. It, at that time, it was Vibrio Eltor. And you can see here that this Eltor could be differentiated from the classical by several cultural tests. Also, susceptibility to phage and susceptibility to polymyxin, cholestine. The Eltor was resistant to polymyxin B, cholestine. And at first, the first case in Indonesia, it was not considered as a cholera. It was named at that time para cholera. And so control measures were not taken. And in a few years, the para cholera spread beyond Indonesia, reaching Southeast Asia, India, Africa in 1970, America in 1991. So it was really a pandemic. It was the seventh pandemic, and we are still in the seventh pandemic. So there are different methods that have been used to uh, type this Vibrio cholerae biotap altor. So the first one to, was to differentiate by serotyping. It was we describe O1 Ogawa, O1 Inaba, O1 Iwo Jima. So it, the differentiation is just based on the metid group present on the LPS. So, uh, and actually, it's uh, not a very good method because during an outbreak, the strain can switch from the Ogawa serotype to the Inaba serotype just by disrupting a single gene. People also use phage typing, ribotyping, PFGE, sequencing of a single gene like the CTXB, the TCPA, sequencing other virulent genes. So if you read the literature, you can see that many people can publish uh, on cholera, they publish on their own strain by their own methods. And if by chance they use the same method like PFG, they won't use the same enzyme. So it's really impossible to try to understand the circulation of Vibrio cholerae altor at a global scale. So that's why we decide to use whole genome sequencing. Actually, whole genome sequencing has truly revolutionized molecular epidemiology and surveillance uh, since the last years. So the first genome that have been published is quite a recent paper in Nature in 2000. It was um, the N16961, an isolate from Bangladesh, isolated in 1975. So it's a classical genome of four megabases, but the particularity is that there are two different chromosomes, a large chromosome sizing three megabase and a small chromosome sizing one megabase. The phage containing the CTX toxin is located on the large chromosome, but in some population it could be also located on the small chromosome. And the large, the super integron is, con is located on the small chromosome. So recently we published a paper uh, on the sequence, the whole genome sequence of more than 200 genomes collected of Vibrio cholerae O1 
collected in America uh, during the last decades, and it was isolated, collected during outbreaks, during the epidemics, the 1991 epidemics of Latin America, but also from sporadic case, from uh, inter-epidemic case. So we had a, a vast collection of strains, and we showed that only, actually only two clones of Vibrio cholerae O1 containing the CTX toxin are responsible for the uh, epidemic cholera. These are the classical here and the seventh pandemic El Tor clone. The two clones are made of, are, uh, co uh, constituted by a very genetically homogeneous population and uh, the two populations are separated, separated by more than 20,000 SNPs. So very different population, but only these two clones are associated with epidemic cholera. The other clones, for example, this one, this one, were associated with only sporadic case or small outbreaks without secondary case and generally linked with an aquatic reservoir, some often waterborne or foodborne infection. So it means that genomics actually can predict the epidemiological uh, potential of a Vibrio cholerae O1 CTX positive isolate. But the, the pioneer study for uh, the seventh pandemic L2 uh, population uh, was published six, seven years ago by the Sanger Institute in the UK, and this uh, study dealt with uh, more than 100 global uh, genomes and uh, by a phylogenetic approach, they found that the, this population was genetically homogeneous. When I say genetically homogeneous, I mean that uh, there were only 200 SNPs, 250 SNPs found in the 100 genomes collected from during several decades, so it's very genetically homogeneous. They describe uh, three, three waves of uh, global dissemination of these seventh pandemic health tour population, and they confirm the role of the Bay of Bengal, because all the diversity, the genomic diversity, was observed only in the strains isolated in the Bay of Bengal. And they also describe, as you can see here, several intercontinental transmission events. But as you can see here, there is a big question mark because uh, they use only 28 isolates from Africa and uh, only one from West Africa. And as Africa shares now most of the burden of uh, cholera infection, for example, every year Africa reports more than 100,000 cases, Currently, it means that it was necessary to dedicate a study to Africa. So, what was known about cholera and Africa? So, it's a recent uh, pathogen because it was observed uh, for the first time in 1970 and before Africa was free. Uh, from cholera for almost one century. So it was a new disease with particular symptoms. So it was very easy to chart the course of the disease during the early 70s. So people, epidemiologists, describe the arrival of uh, cholera at the same time in Egypt in August 70 and in Guinea in 1970. Later, a new strain was identified in uh, Eastern Africa, in Ethiopia, in, in, Ethiopia in, 19, in November 1970. Then the strain propagated for, from Guinea along the coastline to reach Cameroon six months after, and also penetrated inland uh, to reach Mali and then propagated along the Niger River and eventually uh, ended up uh, around the Lake Chad Basin. 
But then after, due to the lack of discriminatory method to tie to the strain, the, it was impossible to chart the course of the, uh, of the cholera. So it means that some people believe that the cholera was introduced once in Africa and then has been circulating since. Also, at that time, there was a mystery about the introduction of cholera into Guinea. So people wrote that it could have been due to Guinean students returning from USSR because at that time there was an outbreak in Odessa in the uh, Black Sea. Some other pe uh, uh, people wrote that it could have been due to soldiers or pilgrims returning from the Middle East. So what, was the, what were the objectives of our study? It was to identify the introduction and transmission routes of cholera in Africa since the beginning of the uh, seventh pandemic, 1970-2014. We wanted also to link uh, the different outbreaks and also to monitor antimicrobial resistance. For this, we sequenced more than 700 isolates with a majority from uh, my lab at the Pasteur Institute and also we include published genome and eventually we did the analysis on more than 1000 genomes uh, including 600 from Africa uh, from 45 African countries. So I won't go into details from, for the genomic uh, methodology, but we use a classical approach, which is mapping. So we take the reads generated by the Illumina platform, and then we map to a reference genome to extract robust single nucleotide polymorphisms. And these SNPs were used to uh, draw the different phylogenies. So we, we did obtain such phylogenies by two different approach, a classical one, maximum likelihood, and uh, another, which is a, a dated phylogeny, and uh, thanks to more than 9,000 SNPs. And the phylogeographic analysis of these three helped us to determine that uh, the cholera was actually introduced more, at least 11 times uh, from Asia to Africa, but also once from Africa to another continent over the last uh, five decades. So, we also solved the mystery of the Guinean outbreak. Actually, the strain found in Guinea was the same as the one that was isolated in the Middle East. We also found that uh, five introductions concern West Africa and six East Africa. And we found that Middle East acted as a springboard for six introductions, the first one. And once introduced, the lineage uh, circulated from one year to 20 years in the different uh, fossils. Uh, two fossils were uh, identified the West African one and the East African one with very rare overlaps. It uh, happened two times in our study. First one, it was during the early 70s with the first lineage here that crossed all Africa to, and it was during the decolonization war of Portugal. So troops brought the cholera from Angola to Mozambique. And recently, it was here, strain from a lineage circulating around the Great Lakes, then uh, reached Kinshasa and the Atlantic uh, coastline. And so it was quite uh, a new phenomenon because otherwise we didn't see any overlaps. And also the T2 lineage, it's an offshoot of the T1, uh, was the cause of the uh, Peruvian epidemic of 1991, more than 500,000 cases in Latin America afterwards. 
So just two slides about antibiotic resistance, because we have a, such a data set that it was very interesting to monitor antimicrobial resistance. And you can see here, uh, I, I plotted the resistance susceptibility to different antibiotics. Each lane corresponds to a different antibiotic, and when it's red, it means resistance. And you can see here the phylogenetic tree with the three different waves, wave three being the most recent. And you can see that the red squares uh, have accumulated in wave three strains. And when you look the different period of time, before 84, almost all the isolates were susceptible to antibiotics, uh, whereas after 2000, none of the isolates, more than 300, were susceptible to antibiotics. And recently, the average was six resistance, antibiotic resistant gene per isolate. But hopefully, only 16% of the strain were resistant to tetracycline. Tetracycline is the first line drug choice recommended by different uh, institutions like WHO to treat patients. Thanks to genomics, it was possible also to determine the structure bearing the resistance gene. And we show that uh, during the first phase of cholera in Africa, during the 70s, 80s, during wave one, genomic wave one and two, the resistance was acquired through large ink uh, incompatibility group, ink AC plasmids, and that were acquired in Africa and often following mass chemoprophylaxis, like in Tanzania in 78 or in Madagascar in 2001. And, but recently, after the 80s, during the wave three, uh, the resistance was born on chromosomal determinants on large genomic island, like the SXT genomic island. Also, we observe GRA and PARC chromosomal mutation encoding resistance to nalidixic quinolone and decreased susceptibility to fluoroquinolone. And all the resistance was acquired in South Asia, so before being introduced into Africa. So, to conclude, we, uh, this study showed that there was not just a single introduction of cholera into Africa, but several iterative, regular introduction of cholera from Asia into Africa with two separated foci, Western and Eastern one. We confirmed the role of the Middle East as a springboard for the introduction of cholera into Africa. It was well known during the first pandemic of classical, of course. That's why the French and English government asked to the, the uh, Ottoman Sultan to create quarantine station in Egypt during the 19th century. But recently, it seems that the cholera was introduced directly from South Asia into Africa without the Middle, Eastern, Middle East hub. Our data also do not support a long-term environmental reservoir of seventh pandemic health tour in Africa. And also we have shown that the bug has accumulated antimic antimicrobial resistance over time, and with also chromosomal determinants. That's, that's important because you can get, the bug can get rid of a plasmid without selective pressure, but when it's fixed onto the chromosome, it's more difficult to, for the bug to get rid of uh, this uh, structure. So we also showed this, uh, observed the same things for two other human pathogens, Chigella dysenteria type one and Salmonella typhi H, 58, also pathogen from India. So for the future studies, we want to understand the factors associated with the disappearance replacement of the, the lineage of Africa over time. Could it be due to herd immunity, lytic phage in the environment or other 
Uh, and also we are building a global genomic database of seven pandemic health or isolate and to help people to carry out a real-time genomic surveillance of cholera because it's clear that for cholera, seven pandemic cholera, genomic tools are the best uh, tools to if you want to subtype the strains. So if you want to learn more, we published uh, the story several months ago in a, a well-known uh, American journal. And also it's a huge, uh, it was a huge project with many collaborators and in red I, I uh, brought all the people from uh, Africa. So, and now thank you for your attention.